this is uh, an introduction to the thinking of the Rainbow Warrior, which was um, which happened in Auckland, the import of Auckland, uh, in um, 1985, and it was a big, big event um, in um, our history. Um, so this is the PowerPoint to introduce the anti-nuclear movement and thinking of Rainbow Warrior. Um, for excellence in NCA, we are looking uh, to comprehensively describe um, everything involving showing a thorough in the understanding of the causes and consequences of an historical event using appropriate supporting evidence. Uh, this is Rainbow Warrior, um, the flagship, the Greenpeace flagship, uh, which was the leader of the um, anti-nuclear protests and um, was sunk by the French in uh, Port of Auckland. Um, a little bit of background, uh, nuclear testing in the Pacific um, uh, in the 1950s, uh, New Zealand uh, military personnel uh, was um, actually involved in this kind of uh, nuclear testing, but only as observers. We observed British and American nuclear tests in Australia, the Pacific and um, Nevada desert. And vessels of the Royal New Zealand Navy, Navy served as weather ships for British tests in the Indian Oceans. Um, uh, when New Zealand and Australia aligned themselves with the United States uh, via the ANZUS Agreement, Australia New Zealand United States Agreement in 1951, they kind of accepted the protection of what some described as the nuclear umbrella. So we've been under this umbrella of protection. Of course, that's a metaphor um, uh, kind of involving the um, uh, shape of a nuclear explosion, which is in a format of a, a mushroom, which can show like an umbrella, uh, can look like an umbrella. Uh, nuclear weapons played a major part in the United States uh, military arrangements, and the possible use of nuclear weapons or nuclear power vessels was uh, implicit in any United States response to an attack on uh, New Zealand, which is very uh, disturbing in a way, uh, kind of um, giving you some um, peace of mind because of the protection involved, but also, uh, if you think, um, um, being defended uh, through nuclear weapons power is not really very reassuring. Uh, two key issues emerging here. While from the 1960s New Zealand consistently protested against nuclear testing in the Pacific, uh, the defense arrangements mean that um, um, New Zealand engaged with nuclear weaponry in other forms. Uh, from the early 70s to the mid 80s, uh, two key issues emerged. Uh, there was a strong, strong opposition in New Zealand to French nuclear tests uh, at Mururoa, Mururoa Atoll, a uh, little bit of a tiny island um, in the Pacific, and opposition to American warships visits to New Zealand, of course, because these uh, warships were um, kind of um, nuclear propelled or they had nuclear um, um, uh, weapons uh, on board or nuclear capability, as they call it. The sinking of the the sinking of the Rainbow Warrior in Auckland in July '85 was a defining moment in this period, and you'll see later on that this uh, literally changed uh, heaps of uh, things on the um, alliances and uh, friendships uh, in between uh, big powers on this planet. After the Second World War, the United States, along with uh, its French and British allies, they frequently tested nuclear weapons in the Pacific region. Why? Because it was in kind of like in the middle of nowhere. They didn't care too much about how many people will affect and uh, all that stuff. And um, they didn't want to do it in their own yard, apart from the Americans who performed some of these in uh, Nevada. In the 1950s, uh, New Zealand military personnel um, uh, observed that all these things and vessels of the Royal uh, New Zealand Navy served as weather ships for British tests in the Indian Ocean. In 1963, the British, American and Soviet governments agreed to ban atmospheric tests. Uh, New Zealand also signed this treaty, but India, China and France were among those countries which did not, and they continued 
their nuclear endeavors. Uh, this is um, uh, one image with the French nuclear bomb tested Moruroa Atoll in 1970. Um, and it looked like that. Mororo Atoll is just an island. You can see it here. Uh, just a small, small, tiny island um, in a, a large ocean, Pacific Ocean. Um, New Zealand was involved in ongoing protests, obviously, uh, over French nuclear testing from the mid-60s when France uh, began testing nuclear weapons in French Polynesia. Obviously, French Polynesia would be uh, the area, the area in the Pacific where um, France uh, will have some of the colonies, um, places where people will speak in French, and um, uh, so their place of interest. Mururoa or Mururoa Atoll um, uh, became the focal point for both the tests and for protests, for opposition to the tests. Greenpeace vessels sailed into the test site in 1972. Uh, and the following year, the New Zealand and Australian governments took France to the International Court of Justice in an attempt to ban uh, all these tests. France ignored the court ruling, which actually ruled in favour of New Zealand and Australia, and that they must uh, cease testing. They didn't care too much about that. And these are the boys um, uh, kind of like um, opposing um, uh, these people. Uh, military moves. The third Labour government, led by Norman Kirk, responded um, to the bombing um, by sending two Navy frigates, um, Her Majesty New Zealand uh, ship Otago and Canterbury, into the test area with a cabinet minister on board. Um, um, Norman Kirk put all these cabinet ministers' names into a hat and drew out um, the name of um, the Minister of Immigration and Mines at that time, Fraser Coleman. Uh, there are some inside the insiders that uh, they perpetuate this joke, uh, kind of a joke, <laughs> it's not really funny, uh, that suggested that the lowly ranked Coleman's name had been written on every slip of paper, and so this is the way how um, um, he was elected to be part of this. Uh, these are the frigates we sent um, following the bombing. As a response to that, uh, we didn't send the frigates to fight the French, but to kind of protest to the bombing and to kind of acknowledge that the government of New Zealand is um, representing New Zealand and they don't want this testing to go ahead. Uh, on these frigates, uh, frigates we've had uh, hundreds of people on board, personnel, and um, including a um, member of the parliament. So a very, very strong presence uh, in Mururo Atoll at that time. Uh, the opposition national party declined Kirk's invitation to send a representative on the protest voyage. Um, Jack Marshall, who was the leader of the national party at that point, uh, saw the dispatch of the frigate as irresponsible. Um, and uh, he added that this is a futile and empty gesture would, uh, which will only inflame um, the entire situation, which uh, it's in a way is correct because, um, yes, um, you don't want to inflame the situation which is already inflamed. Uh, Marsh's preference was to uh, take France back to the International Court. On the other hand, the International Court of Justice already ruled against France and France didn't give a toss, so it was not really effective, not um, um, through the diplomatic channels. Uh, so both parts, they had their own um, reasons. Uh, Coleman sailed from Auckland on 28th of June aboard the Otago, which carried a crew of 242 people, quite a big number. A month later, the ship was at Mururoa, and those on board witnessed the first atmospheric test. Uh, Coleman transferred to the Canterbury when he arrived to relieve the Otago, and he and the crew saw the second French atmospheric test uh, on Mururoa. Uh, these protests, um, though, achieved some uh, remarkable success. In 1974, um, the new French president, which was uh, Valéry Giscard d'Estaing, uh, ordered that the tests uh, should move underground, which was not a, a ceasefire. Um, 
uh, a stopping of the tests, but um, an understanding that um, atmospheric tests are too damaging for the environment. Of course, the um, uh, underground ones are uh, damaging too, but uh, it was really um, like a kind of negoti negotiations and that was um, a good outcome. Uh, with testing continuing, however, Mururoa remained a focus of anti-nuclear protests, especially from Greenpeace Flotilla and uh, uh, the New Zealanders. Um, now, New Zealanders protested a lot uh, before uh, all these um, uh, before all these uh, things uh, to happen. They protested a lot uh, when um, New Zealand was visited by nuclear power frigates. Uh, and the first, some of the first one to visit was USS Texas in 1983. Um, the visit sparked um, um, heaps of protests in New Zealand. An election was just around the corner, and the issue of nuclear ships visiting um, played a prominent part in the uh, campaign. Um, visits from warships like the Texas has been a controversial topic long before the 1984 election. Uh, two nuclear power cru cruisers, the USS Truxton and the USS Long Beach, had attracted protests uh, when they visited New Zealand in 1976. On each occasion, Civil Defence established a public safety headquarters for the duration of the visit. Similar action was taken for the visits of the submarines USS Pintado in 78 and USS Hado in 79. And this was clearly a recognition of the risks posed by this uh, technology. So New Zealanders uh, wanted to say stop to these um, visits. We don't want this your nuclear power around. We don't want your nuclear capabilities around. We want to be nuclear free. Uh, people were feeling really, really uncomfortable um, because the American policy was um, needed to confirm or deny that they are uh, nuclear armed or nuclear powered. Uh, they were in a kind of a limbo and we didn't uh, know exactly what kind of capabilities these uh, ships have. Um, public opinion was increasingly in favor of banning, banning these visits, stopping these visits altogether. In uh, only five years, opposition to nuclear arm visit um, rose from 32 to 72 percent, from one third to more than two thirds of the country not wanting these people around with their nuclear weapons. Few New Zealanders felt threatened by the Soviet Union, um, but they feared a nuclear bomb and agreed with David Lange that there's only one thing worse than being incinerated by your enemies, and that's being incinerated by your friends. Uh, here is a photo uh, with anti-nuclear protesters in Wellington, Port of Wellington, our country nuclear weapons free. So these are the people who started the movement uh, in Wellington. You can see heaps of people uh, in there uh, on a vessel. There was some support, uh, though, for um, these visits. The uh, national government, led by Robert Muldoon, says these visits as an important expression of New Zealand support for ANZUS. Remember the treaty between Australia and New Zealand and USA and the country's relationship with the United States. It was an election year in 1984, and Robert Muldoon decided to go to the polls early on 14th of July. He called the election earlier. This was due partly to a decision by Marlene Waring, a National Party member of Parliament, to withdraw her support for the National Caucus on 14 of June. She had been savagely attacked by Robert Muldoon for supporting the Labour opposition nuclear free New Zealand bill the previous day. Um, Labour campaigned against nuclear propulsion and weapons, but not against ANZUS. The Americans neither confirmed nor denied policy would make it difficult to a Labour government to reconcile these two targets. Um, Labour obviously won the election and immediately made clear uh, its intention to pursue the policy that would establish New Zealand as a nuclear-free country. Actually, the nuclear-free stance of um, uh, our country stands against nuclear weapons was uh, Labour make. Uh, this was a popular stand, and by the end of the year, uh, 
nearly 40,000 boroughs have declared themselves nuclear free, a symbolic gesture. It was not really a very important thing because they didn't have nuclear weapons around, but they declared themselves nuclear free. They don't want to see any, in any way, in any form or shape, any nuclear weapons or something like that. Labour obviously announced its decision to ban ships that uh, were uh, nuclear powered or armed. The United States maintained its position and stalemate was quickly reached. Uh, in politics, five days after his defeat in the election, the outgoing Prime Minister Robert Muldoon met the United States Secretary of Sta State George Schultz, who was in Wellington for an Anzus Council meeting. Lange labeled this a calculated attempt to embarrass the new Labour government, and I think it was because um, since the Labour government was installed, um, the Secretary of State, which was uh, the, one of the highest ranking uh, people to visit New Zealand, uh, he should have actually met uh, with um, the new Prime Minister, not with the old one. Um, in 1984, so not really good um, understanding between USA and um, New Zealand. In 1984, the United States requested that the aging guiding uh, missile destroys USS Buchanan visit uh, New Zealand. The Americans hoped that the perception that it's not really nuclear armed would be enough for it to slip under the political radar. Uh, unfortunately for them, on 4th of February 1985, the government said no. Washington uh, cut visible intelligence and military ties with New Zealand and downgraded political uh, and diplomatic exchanges. George Schultz confirmed that the United States will no longer maintain its security guarantee to New Zealand, although the ANZUS Treaty structure remained in place. In 19 1987, Labour passed the New Zealand Nuclear Free Zone Disarmament and Arms Control Act, and in a very uh, symbolic response, uh, the United States Congress retaliated with the Broomfield Act, downgrading uh, New Zealand from uh, attention, from the status, from ally to just a friend. Uh, David Lange stated that if the Security Alliance was the price New Zealand must pay to remain nuclear free, it is the price we are prepared to pay. And in 1989, 52% of New Zealanders indicated they would rather break defence ties than admit nuclear armed ships. And then by 1990, even National had signed up to anti-nuclearism. Um, in 1985, back again, New Zealand was basking in its position as leader to the anti-nuclear movement. As a country, it had clearly punched above its weight. Just before midnight on the evening of 10th of July, two explosions uh, ripped uh, through the hull of the Greenpeace flagship Rainbow Warrior, which was moored at Marsen Wharf in Auckland. Uh, a Portuguese crew member, Fernando Pereira, was killed in the explosions, and the Rainbow Warrior um, uh, was actually uh, the um, a vessel which was involved in protests over French nuclear testing in the Pacific. Uh, the Rainbow Warrior was um, destroyed. Uh, French Secret Service DGCE agents were sent to prevent it, leaving for another protest campaign at Morato. They planted a bomb and the bomb exploded and destroyed the vessel. Um, two of these officers, Dominic Prior, a lady, and Alan Mafart, a gentleman, were arrested on 24th of July, two weeks after the bombing. Both were charged with murder. Uh, they pleaded guilty to manslaughter, and to their surprise, they were sentenced to 10 years imprisonment, which was very big. The case was a source of considerable embarrassment to the French government, while the attack was on international organization rather than uh, New Zealand itself. Most New Zealanders did not make such a distinction. They were thinking, um, you attacked us in Port of Auckland, it's an attack on New Zealand. Uh, the fact that it was committed on New Zealand territory by a supposed friend produced a huge sense of outrage and a serious deterioration in relations between New Zealand and France. France used its influence to threaten New Zealand's access to the important economic uh, 
European Economic Community Market and New Zealand Exports to France were boycotted. New Zealand's reacted in a similar manner. They didn't want to buy any French products or have anything to do with France. Eventually, both countries agreed to allow the United Nations to mediate a settlement. And almost a year after the bombing on 8th of July 1986, United Nations Secretary, which was a very famous uh, United Nations Secretary General Javier Perez de Cuellar, announced in a binding uh, decision that New Zealand will receive an apology. Binding decision will make the decision uh, complete, will um, make it compulsory. So uh, France um, should. Uh, and would obey, so they have to um, uh, write an apology and to compensate um, uh, the government of New Zealand and uh, Greenpeace with $13 million. Dominic Prior and Alain Maffard were to serve their sentences in full on how at all in French Polynesia, so not on New Zealand soil. Um, it was seen as the final insult because both prisoners were released early after just two years. Alan Maffard returned to France because of illness in 1987, while Dominique Prior was repatriated in May 1988 because she was pregnant. Both were decorated and promoted upon their return home. Uh, this incident did much to promote what has been described as New Zealand's silent war of independence, and was central to an upsurge in New Zealand nationalism. There was a sense of having to go it alone because of the traditional allies such as the United States and Britain sat on their hands while France worked to block New Zealand exports. The failure of Britain and the United States to condemn this act of terrorism hardened support for a more independent foreign policy line, which happened uh, after this. Uh, in September 2006, the agent who placed the bomb was named as Gerard Royal by his brother Antoine. Their sister, Ségolène Royal, was the socialist candidate in the 2007 French presidential elections. And that's it. This is the introduction of um, the sinking of the Rainbow Warrior, which was one of the most significant events of the last century happening. Uh, in New Zealand.